Armed Forces Appreciation Day ceremony. Before I introduce our Master of Ceremonies, I'm uh, going to want to thank a few people here. Uh, one is David Hines and Glenna Hayhoe. Actually, Bruce and Dave and the America's uh, Military and First Responder Museum, I had to think because I recently changed the name, uh, are the sponsors for the lunch. So please join me in thanking them for lunch. And Dave and Glenn, if you could stand up. Uh, Bruce couldn't make it, but Bruce and Glenn are our founders here at Aval, if you don't know. And Dave, thanks again for everything you do for us. Also want to thank the Palm Meadow Ridge High JRTC for the saber guard they were doing before we got rained out, so thank you guys. <laughs> and also the young Marines who had given out stars earlier as people were coming in. I want to thank them for their participation. <laughs> this year's Master of Ceremonies, Jerry Sanford was born and raised in Staten Island. He served in the U.S. Navy from 1956 to 1962. After his service in the Navy, Jerry had a 20-year career with various fire companies in New York City. In 1992, he was appointed press secretary to the New York City Fire Commissioner. He retired from the fire department five years later, and in 2000, he moved to Naples. Retirement, however, did not last long for Jerry, because a few months after moving to Naples, he was hired by the North Naples Fire District as their public information officer. Jerry attended an event in the South Bronx on behalf of the North Collier Fire District, and flew out of New York City on the morning of September 11th, 2001, just a few hours before the attacks on the World Trade Center. He returned to New York City five days later and spent one month in the New York City Fire Department's press office, coordinating press with major network news affiliates. In 2001, Jerry formed the Gulf Coast Retired Firefighters Association and was president for six years. In 2003, he joined a task force to build a lasting Freedom Memorial in Naples to remember the innocent people killed on September 11th and all the members of the armed forces who have fought and died for our freedom. The Freedom Memorial was dedicated on September 9th, 2016 and stands surrounded by commemorative bricks in the Fred W. Cole Freedom Park. Coil. Jerry is currently a board member of the Gulf Coast Veterans and Friends, which provides community support to veterans in Southwest Florida. And in 2021, Jerry co-authored a bestseller title that started with a helmet. The story recounts him finding an antique New York City Fire Department helmet in Naples. The journey includes him returning it to its proper home at the South Bronx Prospect Avenue Firehouse the day before 9-11 and his return to service with the New York City Fire Department in the recovery efforts following the attacks. Please join me in welcoming our Master of Ceremonies, Jerry Sanford. Thank you, Mark. It's an honor to be here uh, with my fellow veterans and a lot of my friends. Uh, at this time, I would uh, Ask you all to please rise as uh, Old Glory will be recited to us by Senior Vice Commander Jack Fulmer. I am the flag of the United States of America. My name is Old Glory. I fly atop the world's tallest buildings. I stand watch in America's halls of justice. I fly majestically over institutions of learning. I stand guard with power in the world. Look up and see me. I stand for peace, honor, truth, and justice. I stand for freedom. I am confident. I am arrogant. I am proud. When I'm flown with my fellow banners, my head is a little higher, my colors a little truer. I bow to no one. I am recognized all over the world. I am worshiped, I am saluted, I am loved, I am revered, I am respected, and I'm feared. I fought in every battle, 
of every war for more than 200 years. I was flown at Valley Forge, Gettysburg, Shiloh, and Appomattox. I was there at San Juan Hill, the trenches of France in the Argonne Forest, Pearl Harbor, Anzio, Rome, and the beaches of Normandy, Guam, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, Korea, Quezon, Saigon, Iraq, and Afghanistan. I was there. I led my troops. I was a little dirty, battle-worn, and tired, but my soldiers cheered me on, and I was proud. I have been burned, torn, and trampled on the streets of the countries I have helped to set free. It does not hurt, for I am invincible. My name is Old Glory. Would you all kindly join me in a Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You can sit down, sir. But all, you, all the rest of you youngins. At this time, I would uh, ask uh, the vow chaplain, John King, to come forward and lead us in the invocation. Sir. Good afternoon. May I ask you to bow your heads so we can offer a wonderful prayer. Almighty God, who art the author of liberty and the champion of the oppressed, hear our prayers. We, the men and women of the special forces, acknowledge our dependence upon thee and the preservation of human freedom. Go with us as we seek to defend the defenseless and to free the enslaved. Heavenly Father, we command 
to your gracious care in keeping all men and women of our armed forces at home and abroad. Defend them day by day with your heavenly grace. Strengthen them in their trials and temptations and give them courage to face the perils that beset them. And help them to know that nothing can separate them from your love. In Jesus Christ our Lord. O Lord God of hosts, stretch forth, we pray, your almighty arm to strengthen and protect our service men and women. Support them in times of conflict and in the rest and training. Keep them safe from all evil. Endue them with courage and loyalty and grant them in all things they may serve without reproach. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. amen. Thank you. Please be seated. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Matthew Holliday from the United States Air Force that will read Memorial of the Missing Man. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we invite your attention to the missing soldier table, also known as the fallen comrade in arms table. This is a memorial that is set up in US military dining facilities and at military dining functions. It is here to honor our fallen, missing, or imprisoned members of the United States military services. The table is round to symbolize that our concern for them is never ending. It is set for one, and it is small, representing the frailty of one prisoner alone against his or her oppressors. The single red rose signifies the blood that so many have shed to protect the freedom of our beloved United States of America. The red ribbon on the vase reminds us of the family and friends of those missing who keep the faith waiting for answers. The black napkin represents the emptiness that these warriors have left in the hearts of their families and friends. The slice of lemon on the plate reminds us of their bitter fate. The salt sprinkled on the plate is symbolic of the countless tears of their families as they still wait at home. The glass is inverted, reminding us that our comrades cannot toast with us or join in the festivities here today. The chair stands empty, for they are not here. The candle is reminiscent of the light of hope for a joyous reunion with those who are unaccounted for and shines in our hearts to illuminate, illuminate their way home to their families and a grateful nation. The yellow ribbon on the candle represents the yellow ribbons worn on the lapels of many thousands who demand a proper accounting of those who are not with us today. And finally, the Bible represents our faith in a higher power and the Pledge of Allegiance to our country, founded as one nation under God. Let us always remember their sacrifices. You are not forgotten. We salute you. Thank you all. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend and United States Air Force and Aval volunteer, Jessica Stearns. Jess? President Harry S. Truman declared, our debt to the heroic men and valiant women in the service of our country can never be repaid. They have earned our undying gratitude. America will never forget their sacrifice. The military is made up of six branches, each with their own active duty and part-time components. Each varies in service commitment, location, and how its members contribute to the overall mission 
of protecting our country. Though all components are on the same rank-based pay scale. The Army is the oldest branch of the U.S. military. The Army protects the security of the United States and its resources. The Marine Corps is often first on the ground in combat situations. The Navy delivers combat-ready naval forces while maintaining security in the air and at sea. The Air Force protects American interests at home and abroad with a focus on air power. The Coast Guard is a maritime force offering military, law enforcement, humanitarian, regulatory, and diplomatic capabilities. The Space Force depends, defends U.S. interests on land, in the air, and from orbit with a range of advanced training and technology. The Air Force currently determines career and accession paths for military and civilian personnel assigned to or wanting to be assigned in the, the Space Force. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce the Hugs Ukulele Band. And if you're able to stand when your uh, branch of service is played, would you kindly rise? The U.S. Army. U.S. Marines. U.S. Navy.
Thank you, Hugs. That's wonderful. And now it's my honor, distinct pleasure, to introduce our keynote speaker, Chaplain Brigadier General Kenneth Ed Brandt, the United States Army retired, served the Army National Guard for nearly 32 years. He retired in May 2020 from his last duty assignment in Arlington, Virginia, as the Chief Chaplain, National Guard Bureau, and United States Army Deputy Chief of Chaplains. Army National Guard, excuse me, that should have been in the, he provided religious advice to Chief National Guard Bureau and served as liaison to the United States Army Chief of Chaplains. I could go on and on, there it is, but the general said, shut up, Jerry. That's right. <laughs> it is so good to be here. When you sing that service song, sing it like you mean it. All right? Well, first of all, a big thank you to Mark Beeland and to Aval for the, uh, the gracious invitation to speak with you today and to tell a couple chaplain stories, a little bit about the National Guard, a little bit about my history as well. And the, uh, that was like, rattling down the podium. I thought it was another phone going off today. I wasn't sure like that. But the uh, proclamation was read that President Truman made back in uh, 1950, so there's no need to do that. And uh, when you talk about the armed services, this big umbrella of people who have been called to service, it's an umbrella of people who have answered a call. It's not just clergy who receive a call. It is people in the profession of arms who also answer a call to serve. Those who didn't run away, but those who stayed, who wore the fabric of our nation and went to places that they never heard of, met people that they will never see again, and they came back here. I remember when I deployed to Iraq in uh, 2008. It was in Dover, Delaware. Our unit was lined up, and a group of Vietnam veterans. It's great seeing Wayne Smithy here. He's one of our heroes, so Wayne, it's good to see you. But the Vietnam, net, Vietnam vets, they shook each of our hands, looked us straight in the eye, and they, was, they said, we will never let happen to you what happened to us. So I want to say thank you for your service, Wayne, and to all the Vietnam vets who are here today. So thank you so much for that. <clears throat> At the first church I served in Newport, Pennsylvania, has anyone ever been to Newport, Pennsylvania? Wow, okay. It is northwest of Harrisburg. There is one traffic light more dear than people. Okay? And I was on a, I was on a citizen's, senior citizens board, and the local insurance agent came up to me and said, Ed, have you ever thought about being in the National Guard? And I said, never. I have never thought of that at all. And so one thing led to another. He put me in touch with the state chaplain of Pennsylvania, Chaplain Earl Brooks, God rest his soul. And so I got a direct commission, and during that time of speaking with Earl Brooks, he said this to me, 1989, Ed, don't worry, you'll never get deployed. <laughs> there might be a flood or maybe a prison riot, but don't worry. And so what, about three or four years later, it was Gulf War I, okay, and then I didn't go to that, but I went in 2008, 2009 to Baghdad, Iraq, where I served. It was during that year, uh, a lot of things happened in uh, people's life, but the privilege for me during that time was meeting people face-to-face -face in their needs, seeing them daily, every single day. Now, the National Guard, how many have served in the National Guard? Hands go up? Okay, thank you for your service. So the National Guard is one weekend a month, and it's two weeks a year. And when I see you just one weekend a month, or two weeks a year, I really like you. But now I am with you every single day for 365 days, and guess what? I don't like the way you chew your gum anymore. I don't like the way you sip your soda and the way you gulp or eat with your mouth open. And so the biggest issue we had was people working together, the stresses and toils that took place in that. There's just a, a privilege for me to wear the, the fabric of our nation, it was a true honor to do that, to, to be a part of a purpose bigger than myself. And so, you know, it was during that time that I had the honor of, I did weddings for people. 
I had the honor, and it really was a privilege to, to officiate at a funeral for someone who lived their life, a long, long life, and to uh, celebrate what they have done. In fact, it was, it's ironic. So the National Guard, you know, part-time, uh, part-time military person, when people retired after 40 years who never deployed, and you would go to their funeral, and they were like 85, 90 years old, they would wear their dress blues in the casket. That's how they were dressed. It was a part-time job. It wasn't like 40 years at DuPont or 40 years somewhere else, but that was the highlight of their career because of the camaraderie that people had and the mission that they did and the difference that they made in people's lives. And of course, along with that, there was also the, the, the tragedy of young people who took their life. And I'll forget, I was on a drill weekend in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We got called, I got a call. A uh, young kid went to the park and took his life. And I had to go along with the uh, casualty affairs officer to go and meet the family. And I remember going there. I remember it clear as day because it was in my hometown, Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania. And I walked up to the door and it was a kind of a summer, 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 uh, summer day. And the, uh, the door was open, the screen door was there, and you could look through the screen door and you could see mom just going about her business, washing the dishes, getting ready, and then we had to make that fateful knock on the door. And their lives were changed forever. And so I am thrilled to see young people here, cadets from Palmetto High School, cadets wearing the uniform, cadets learning about patriotism, service to the country, because they are not just the future, they are the present and they are the hope of our nation. Because I tell you what, when I stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance, I mean every single word that is there. And that should just reverberate through our souls. It gives us a sense of inspiration and patriotism that this country is the last great hope of the world, where people can exercise freedom, where people can be who they want to be and make a difference in the world. This is where people escape to this country. No one here is getting on a boat to Cuba. It's not happening. When I was in Landstuhl, Germany, where the first stop is on the way home to Walter Reed Medical Center, I went over there for two weeks with my boss, and we visited people. And I met this young kid. He was a young Marine, great kid. And, and I, you know, it's, it's kind of humorous to say this story, but, you know, he had lost some close colleagues in a firefight. And I saw he had this tattoo on his arm. I said, well, what's the tattoo all about? Well, that's my girlfriend. And I, I wanted to ask, well, what if things don't work out? You, you got this tattoo here with your girlfriend's name on it. But the first thing he responded, when I asked him, how are you doing? How are you making out? He responded, how are my buddies doing? He was more concerned about his fellow Marines than he was about himself. And I, ironic as it is, I went back to D.C. where I was working, and about two months later, I went to Wall Street with my boss again, and guess who's there? This young kid there who's recovering. Again, focused on his fellow Marines. It's service above self. It's giving your life so that there is a future for this nation. It's giving your life because liberty is so precious. That is the hope of our nation. And so chaplains focus, we focus on, we nurture the living, care for the wounded, and honor the dead. That's what we do as chaplains. And I have the, the, the privilege of working with chaplains from a variety of religious faiths, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, and our entire job is to care for members of the military what they need, not to impose our beliefs on them, but to take care of their needs, what they want. I had a young kid who was a Wiccan. I had no idea what a Wiccan was in my unit. No idea at all. I had to look it up. But this kid needed a candle in a room, boom, candle in a room. That was my job, not to judge but to care. That's what we do. That's what we do for that. And so if you look at, uh, uh, there, there, there's a two-volume set called A Spirit Divided. And the one volume is sermons, prayers, memoirs of chaplains from the Union during the Civil War. And the other volume is from the Confederacy of sermons, you know, memoirs, stories from the Confederacy. And so there's this one Confederate chaplain who gets, he, he's walking back to camp, and he's just exhausted as it can be. And he looks over there in the meadow, and there in the meadow is this horse. 
And he thinks to himself, you know what? I'm tired of walking. I want to ride that horse to camp. So he corrals the horse, gets on top of it, rides it back to camp. And the commander comes out and says, Chaplain, where'd you get that horse? Pretty quick on his feet, the chaplain says, well, like Jesus, I barred an ass to go to Jerusalem. And the commander says, Chaplain, you're not Jesus, that's not an ass, and this isn't Jerusalem. Take the horse back, kind of thing. <laughs> but we also have chaplains who gave it all. Chaplain George Rents was a Presbyterian minister. He served as a Navy chaplain during both wars. He was assigned to the USS Houston in 1940. He served tirelessly. In 1942, the ship was attacked, and the ship sunk on March 1st, 1942. Here's a chaplain hanging on to an overcrowded piece of floating material. He tried to give his life jacket to a younger sailor, but nobody wanted to take it. And he ordered, ordered seaman, first class Walter Beeson to take the life jacket. And Rents prayed quietly, abandoned the float, and disappeared. Service above self. Giving your life so that someone else has a life to live. Father Emil Capon was ordained in 1940. Served as an army chaplain from 44 to 46. In 1948, he rejoined the army, was sent to Korea in 1950. Capon worked the battlefields, retrieving the wounded and the dead. He earned the Bronze Star. And on November 1st, he and his unit were captured and marched north to a POW camp. And there, he earned the nickname, The Good Thief, by sneaking food supplies from their captors and giving it to starving prisoners. He cared for the sick, led mass, heard confessions, shared his rations with those who were weaker than he was. And on May 23rd, 1951, he died of pneumonia, and he was awarded the Distinguished Service of Cross after his death. And of course, the last story I'll tell you, a story that's near and dear to my heart, the story of the four chaplains. February 3rd, February 3rd, 1943, the USS Dorchester's crossing the North Atlantic going to Greenland. It gets hit by a torpedo. It goes down in 30 minutes. Four chaplains, one Jewish, one Catholic, one Reformed, and one Methodist. They gave their life jackets to other people on that ship. They even lied. They say, here, take my, take my gloves. No, no, chaplain, you need them. No, I got a second pair. They lied to make sure that somebody would be saved. You know, serving in the military, it was truly an honor for me. There was a purpose of working for the greater good, engaged in a mission that in most cases brought out the best of people. And today we give thanks for all branches of the military, for the men and women who answered the call to serve, who raised their right hand and took an oath to protect this nation from all enemies, foreign and domestic. We thank God for people who serve, who sacrifice and love this country. God bless you and God bless America. Well, outstanding, General. Thank you so much. Uh, I just have a little Navy story. It's not on the, on the program here, I'm to tell you. Uh, I went to boot camp in Bainbridge, Maryland. I'm from New York City, and I sound like I'm from New York City. So I go to Bainbridge, Maryland, and this is in the 50s. And uh, that's kind of the Mason-Dixon line, you know? And I'm down there with a bunch of New Yorkers, and we ran into uh, Southerners. So uh, I'm being kind. Uh, so I'm in the locker room after a day or two, and I hear these two two uh, sailors, recruits like me, and I just about can understand them. You know, I don't know where they're from, the mountains or someplace there, and they say, I want to get a, get a Dr. Pepper. And I, I'm changing my clothes. I'm thinking, boy, they look healthy to me. You know, well, what's, what's wrong with them? They're going to the doctor? Dr. Pepper. Okay, don't forget it. Bainbridge, Maryland, New York City, okay? You think it's far? Okay. So the next day, I go up to them, and of course, they call them us, uh, you know, New Yorkers and all that. I says, hey, you guys, how are you doing? You're making out. How'd you make out of the doctor? 
Well, I tell you, all my time there, the whole base knew Jerry, you know what I mean? The stupid ass, the Dr. Pepper, you know? But I just thought I, uh, you know, with, with, with all we're talking about how seriously we are, we, sometimes you have to have a little humor in life, you know, and laugh at, laugh at each other. But uh, I just wanted to uh, share that with you. Anyway, our, our next reading is from uh, a soldier, United States Army veteran, Robert Fulton. Mr. Fulton, please. There is discipline in a veteran. You can see it when he walks. There is honor in a veteran. You hear it when he talks. There is courage in a veteran. You can see it in his eyes. There is loyalty in a veteran that he will not compromise. There is something in a veteran that makes him stand apart. There is strength in a veteran that beats in his heart. At this time, uh, our group, the Hugs, our ukulele band will perform for us again. Thank you. At this time, Senior Vice Commander Jack Fulmer will, re will lead us and read the folding of the flag along with VFW Post 7721. Gentlemen.
The first fold of our flag is a symbol of life. The second fold is a symbol of our belief in eternal life. The third fold is made in honor and remembrance of the veterans departing our ranks who gave a portion of their lives to the defense of our country to attain peace throughout the world. The fourth fold represents our weaker nature for as American citizens trusting in God, it is to him we turn in times of peace as well in times of war for his divine guidance. The fifth fold is a tribute to our country, for in the words of Stephen Decatur, our country, in dealing with other countries, may she always be right, but it is still our country, right or wrong. The sixth fold is for where our hearts lie. It is with our heart that we pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The seventh fold is a tribute to our armed forces, for it is through the armed forces that we protect our country and our flag against all her enemies, whether they be found within or without the boundaries of the Republic. The eighth fold is a tribute to the one who entered into the valley of the shadow of death, that we might see the light of day. The ninth fold is a tribute to womanhood and mothers, for it has been through their faith and love and loyalty and devotion that the character of the men and women who have made this country great has been molded. The tenth fold is a tribute to the father, for he too has given his sons and daughters for the defense of our country since they were first born. The eleventh fold represents the lower portion of the seal of King David and King Solomon and glorifies in the eyes of the Hebrews the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The twelfth fold represents an emblem of eternity and glorifies in the Christian's eyes God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The thirteenth fold, when the flag is completely folded, the stars are uppermost reminding of us our nation's motto, in God we trust. I would ask you all to rise as our rifle salute this afternoon will be performed by the Marine Corps League of Naples, E.T. Brisson Detachment 063, followed by TAPS.
Uh, before we close, uh, I'd like all our veterans to form up here uh, in a little while, but uh, we have our benediction to be uh, given to us today again by, by Chaplain John King. We pray today for your blessings upon all the men and women in the armed forces who stand ready and willing to serve and defend our country. Grant them steadfastness of heart. Inspire them in the cause of peace. Guide their endeavors as they remain loyal to our country and faithful to you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have a musical send-off by the Hugs Ukulele Band. They'll be playing uh, God, bless, God Bless the USA. And then uh, uh, there's also some thanks I want to give here, and Mark mentioned them before. The American Military and First Responders Museum, Bruce Hayhoe and David Hines. So let's give them a nice round of applause again. <laughs> A young lady that was here with the sign language provided by Savannah Harpin. Uh, Sabre Guard, Palmetto Ridge High School, JROTC, JROTC. And finally, the greeters, the Naples Young Marines. Uh, thank you all for coming. After our music, uh, please, all the veterans, gather up here for a photo. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.